Welcome back. Uh, I'm Dr. Dai, in case you didn't see me in our first set of lectures. Uh, we're going to be jumping into chapter two, the first section, so the building blocks of molecules. Um, we'll describe what matter and elements are, and then we'll look at the interrelationship between protons, neutrons, and electrons, uh, and the ways in which electrons can be donated or shared between atoms, basically bonding. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, everything that occupies space and has mass is composed of matter. Uh, this means that all living things and non-living things are made of matter. Uh, matter is composed of elements. Um, to help us better understand the elements, we can arrange them in columns and rows uh, based on their characteristics. We call that the periodic table. Uh, a nice little picture there. Hopefully it's a little familiar. We're not going to need it a whole lot this semester, but just kind of a broad reminder. Um, the periodic table is, is a vital resource for identifying key information about the elements and how they might interact with each other to form molecules. Uh, there are a total of 118 uh, that have been identified. Only 92 occur naturally and fewer than 30 are typically found in living organisms. Uh, that remaining 26, they're unstable, uh, made in the lab uh, usually, or some of them are just theoretical really. Um, they don't last very long and they decay down into smaller things quickly. Um, each element is designated by a chemical sig uh, symbol, such as H for hydrogen, uh, C for carbon, N for nitrogen, O for oxygen, uh, and each possesses unique chemical properties. An atom is the smallest component of an element. Uh, it retains all the chemical properties of that element. So for example, one hydrogen atom has all the properties of the element hydrogen. So you can think of you know, the term element refers to the, you know, this kind of broad name, right? We have all these properties, we know about it. But we can have hydrogen atoms. You could have one atom you're looking at, or you can have hundreds, thousands of atoms that you're considering, okay? Um, properties of hydrogen, it's a gas at room temperature. Uh, can bond with oxygen to form a water molecule. Um, a hydrogen atom can be broken down into smaller components called subatomic particles. So sub means below, so below an atom, subatomic. Um, but these components, they're not going to have all the properties of hydrogen. Okay, So an atom is the smallest component of an element that retains all its properties. If we were to start breaking it down further, it does not retain those properties. They're going to have their own specific subatomic properties. All right. All right. So all atoms contain subatomic particles. So that's our protons, electrons, and our neutrons. Uh, the exception being hydrogen, which does not, in its uh, neutral state, does not possess a uh, neutron. So what are those things? So proteins are, proteins, excuse me, protons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> protons are positively charged and have a mass of one Dalton. Uh, it's located in the atomic nucleus, okay, so in the center. Um, electrons are negatively charged with no meaningful mass, at least not for our purposes. Sorry to any uh, future chemists out there. Um, they occupy the space around the nucleus. Okay, so you know we demonstrate it at the little drawing, like little shells and circles. It's, it's not quite accurate, but it works for our purposes. Um, and then finally, neutrons, which have no charge, neutron, neutral, no charge. Uh, they're also found in the atomic nucleus alongside the, um, the protons, and it has a mass of one Dalton as well. Uh, when the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons, uh, the atom is neutral, it is without charge. Um, because protons and neutrons have a mass of one, the mass of an atom is equal to the number of protons and neutrons that it possesses. Um, electrons aren't factored in because they're so, they're so small. Uh, now, there are some types of um, oh, like theoretical chemistry where it is, it is considered and it's very important, but again, not, not for our purposes. Um, all right, so every element uh, is unique. Uh, it has a unique number of protons and neutrons. Um, the atomic number assigned to an element is based on the number of protons that element contains. Uh, the mass number, or atomic mass, 
Uh, that's going to be the number of protons plus the number of neutrons that that element has. Um, so we can determine the number of neutrons by subtracting the atomic number from the atomic mass number. Uh, now, and if it's neutral, um, or excuse me, if it's, um, if it's uh, not a isotope, we're going to have the, the same number of, um, of protons and neutrons, typically. Um, but you can have more neutrons or less neutrons. But in order to be that element, it must have that exact number of protons. OK, onward. All right, let's talk about isotopes a little bit more. So isotopes are different forms of the same element, like I was just saying. Um, they have the same number of protons, right? Because in order to be in that specific element, you have to have that set number of protons. But they have a different number of neutrons. Okay. So some elements, like carbon, potassium, and uranium, uh, they have naturally occurring isotopes. So they have, you know, those isotopes can be found out in nature. They don't have to be created in a lab. Um, some isotopes are unstable and will lose protons or other subatomic particles or even just energy. Um, to try to form a more stable element. Uh, we call these radioactive isotopes or radioisotopes. Um, radiocarbon dating, you've heard the term, um, allows us to use this property of um, like loss, like the change in, in um, neutrons, uh, to determine how old things are. So let's, let's look at that a little more closely. Okay, so carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. That means that after 5,730 years, half of the sample of carbon-14 will have decayed, will have converted um, to nitrogen-14. So we can use that fact to reconstruct the ecology and biogeography of organisms living within the past about 50,000 years, kind of the, the limit for using carbon dating because of how short its half-life is. Um, in the example, in the picture here, um, they have unearthed a pygmy mammoth and have determined its age to be at about 50,000 years old using carbon dating. Uh, this works because as a living organism develops, uh, the amount of carbon-14 in its body is equal to the concentration of carbon-14 found in the atmosphere because your, your breathing it in, you know, carbon dioxide, right, CO2, carbon, um, you're eating it, uh, so it's, it's, in, it's in all of your tissues, it's in your bones, okay, but when an organism dies, they stop incorporating new carbon, okay, so you, you have, you know, what you have is what you have, so over time, the, um, the amount, the abundance of carbon-14, um, it will it's going to decay. It's going to start decaying down to nitrogen-14. And we can use the ratio of carbon-14 to nitrogen-14 to, to work out that, that age. Uh, this is called beta decay, going from carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. Now, if you want to date something older than 50,000 years old, we have other options. We um, can use potassium-40, for example, which has a half-life, you ready for this, of 1.28 billion years. So when you see, you know, oh, we've dated this rock and it's, you know, a, you know we found a billion-year-old rock. You know, how could that be done? Potassium. Um, uranium also has an incredibly long half-life. And you can, again, you just compare the ratios. All right.